Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 86 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Gavin. That is Fia. And Fia, I hear you potentially have some some decent news. Yeah, uh, I finished processing all my summer samples. So I picked out all the organisms, dried them, weighed them, measured them. And uh, now I'm on to data analysis and prepping for the fall. But I didn't think I would be able to get it all done. Like as someone who just recently also finished my master's, that is a huge step. I was not done with yeah. my data collection until well into the fall semester, almost to the spring semester. Yep. Um, so you are way ahead of the game as far as I'm concerned. So um, thanks. No, congrats on that. I remember when I was done with my data collection and, and, and stuff like that, it, uh, it sure took a big load off of my shoulders. So yeah, um, I cried a little uh, bit. <laughs> Oh, oh, for sure. I I would be a little concerned if you didn't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like a proud cry. Like, a, I can't. yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, and speaking of potentially crying, uh, we have a word from Mike uh, about how he might <laughs> potentially be crying at the end of today. Uh, if you're listening to this the day that it goes out. So here's Mike. Hey, everyone. Mike here. Um, no hikes since last week for those that have forgotten. I'm trying to do all 46 high peaks in the Adirondack Mountains this summer. Um, due to a combination of weather and some other stuff going on, no um, new high peaks since last week. However, the day you guys are hearing this on Wednesday, I should be back up in the Adirondacks trying to do, um, I think I'm going to try and get four or possibly even five done today in the big loop that I am going around. So I'm looking forward to telling you guys more about that next week. Nothing big or new to report so far. However, that is where things currently stand. Now back to Gavin and Fia. Yeah, so that's that's kind of insane that Mike is wanting to do f- potentially five peaks today. Yep, <laughs> very ambitious. And like, even if they're all fairly close together and not super challenging, that's easily uh, up and down. That's probably like several miles like 10 miles? Yeah. I wouldn't want to do that. Nope, me neither. So hopefully the weather holds out for you today, Mike. Um, I know in, here in the Northeast, it's been very rainy uh, the last, I don't know, probably four or five days or so. So yep. yeah, it's been uh, it's been a little weird, but we needed it. It's been very dry up here. Speaking of somebody who just moved from California as well. Um, <laughs> so yeah today we have an episode partially uh unknowingly inspired by my wife liz she just started a a new job uh here at the same university that i work at uh taking care of some of their research animals and they have uh four species of primates wow which is yeah which is really interesting they have all sorts of other animals as well they have you know rodents and and voles and uh some uh, quails i think some some Mm. kind of bird um, but yeah, four species of primates, which is really cool. Have you ever had quail and, eggs? Um, sort of. It's a little bit of a long, complicated story. I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so, like, I've been noticing this recently. In almost every gas station that I stop at, like, around southern Louisiana, I always see pickled quail eggs. And I just find that interesting. What? Yeah, it's like a thing. Why? Uh, I don't know. They're good. That is so strange. Yeah. Huh. Like pickled eggs. Okay, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't even like pickles myself. Um, yeah. So, but but like pickled eggs. Okay, but pickled quail eggs. That's yeah. a that's a new one. I hadn't heard that one before. Yeah, very common from the gas stations I've been stopping at. Interesting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Louisiana, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Is, is there some that. kind of swamp quail? Uh, I don't, not that I know of, I think. Huh. Maybe it's some sort of tradition. I think I'd have to look into it. Interesting. But yeah. anyway, we're not here to talk about quails <laughs> or their eggs. Uh, we're here to talk about our fun furry cousins the primates yes. uh and also 
us. Um, most of the things you're going to talk about, uh, that I'm going to talk about, uh, especially when I'm talking about different features of, uh, of primates, are going to sound very familiar because you also have most of them. Um, but humans are also very strange primates. Like, we took a lot of things that primates do and ran with it, and then some other things that primates do, and are like, nah, I don't need that anymore. Um, so we're going to talk about primates in general. I'm going to mostly be leaving out human evolution stuff because that is its own can of worms that we can get into at some point in the future. We will not have time for that today. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so when I'm talking about some of the, at least the anatomy things, you can probably at least relate to that a little bit, but um, a little bit about the group themselves. Primates are a, a really diverse group of mammals, um, depending on what source you're looking at. There's somewhere between 370-ish and 520-ish species. Wow. Which is a is a pretty big range. Uh, yeah. But we are we're finding new species all the time. Um, I think in in the decade of the the 2010s, I think like over 30 new species were found. Wow. Yeah. That's really recent. Yeah, and that's that's for a variety of reasons. One, uh, as we'll talk about, primates really tend to live in tropical rainforests, which are hard to survey effectively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For, for new species as we get better with uh, genetic stuff as well we're, we're uh especially because they're closely related to us we do a lot of stuff with their genetics um and so as we sample more populations of different species we realize that certain populations are different enough from other populations of what we thought were the same species uh different enough to sort of split them into two different species so depending on how you count it um they make up somewhere in the ballpark of five percent to 8% of all mammal species, Hmm. which is a lot. Um, The only groups I think that have more are rodents and bats, which are crazy diverse. Yeah. And so uh, first we're going to start off with some some primate features, which, like I said, uh, are going to sound very familiar. So (laughs) we're going to start sort of at at the top of the head and work our way down the body. Um, so first primates have a really highly domed brain case. So like the top of the skull, <laughs> I just find which, that funny how you described it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, highly domed. So it's, it's very round, yeah. um, humans. This is one of the features that humans really took and ran with. Um, humans have giant alien heads, even f- considering, <laughs> you know, other primates. Um, but in general, Um, primates have a a lot of room in their skull dedicated to the brain Um, and and less so to more more to certain parts of the brain than than others so for example um, primates are have a lot of the brain dedicated to sight which is very unusual for mammals Um, we have forward-facing eyes which also is fairly unusual unusual for mammals Um, what would be the unusual Things like horses, where it's sort oh, of okay. on the side, or, or like yeah. goats. Yeah. Um, so for the most part, it's unusual In for the, the I guess, caveat that, uh, as we'll talk about, primates are primarily herbivorous, or at least frugivorous, meaning they eat fruit. So you think of a lot of things that are carnivores have uh, forward-facing eyes, binocular vision, because uh, they that helps with sort of distance judgment and uh, that helps when you're needing to catch your food. But for primates, it's likely that we have forward facing eyes because uh, spoilers, we live in trees. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you jump around in trees a lot and you don't have, have good depth perception, you are not going to be in that tree for very long. Yep. Um. Primates are also fairly unusual in that most primates have a fully or nearly fully enclosed eye socket. Um, If you've ever seen like a Halloween skull, how there's just those two deep pockets for where the eyes go, that is very unusual, uh, especially for mammals. Uh, Most mammals, if you've ever seen like a dog skull or something, um, have at least a bit of a gap between, um, you know, the, the orbital 
it isn't sort of fully enclosed. There's usually a bit of a gap between the, uh, getting a little anatomical terms here, between the zygomatic arch and the postorbital. Um, primates don't have that, at least not all of them. Some of the more primitive ones do. Um, and also unique among mammals, uh, they have extremely acute vision and really good color perception. Uh, we've talked a bit in the past in, I don't remember which of the two episodes, but we've talked about mammal evolution in general um, in episodes uh, 35 and 53. And it's sort of hypothesized that mammals were sort of, you know, the first mammals were primarily nocturnal. So it's like, well, if, if I'm only existing at night, I don't really need sight which is why most mammals have really relatively poor vision and relatively good smell and touch for uh, whiskers. Hmm. Uh, with primates, they just sort of flip that and say, mm, nope, I don't, I don't need whiskers on my face because I can see really well. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, going along with not having whiskers, uh, primates generally have fairly flat, fairly short faces and, and muzzles. You know, you think of something like a dog where it sort of stretches out. Uh, there aren't really any um, primates that have that. Some that are more closely related to the lemurs uh, might have a bit more of a snout like that. But uh, most tend to be relatively flat faced. And again, that's something that humans really took and ran with. Humans have a very, very flat face. <laughs> it's almost like an insult. Oh, it flat is. Face. Humans are garbage. <laughs> Like, humans are designed to do, like, one or two things really well and be horrible at everything else. Um, most primates have what are called bunodont teeth, uh, which just means that they're generally really good omnivore teeth, pretty good for just about everything. They're not, like, the uh, shearing teeth that like you would find in, like, a dog or a cat. Um, they're not the sort of flat, grindy teeth of something like a horse. They're sort of in the middle uh, and mm -hmm. are... Not great at any one particular type of food, but generally good for just about anything you could eat. Hmm. Okay. Uh, something else that is sort of, like I said, as we're moving down the body, uh, primates have an extremely mobile pectoral girdle. So that is your shoulders, your arms, all your the joints in, in your arms. Um, you, we have a really wide range of motion which most mammals don't have. Most animals in general don't have. But uh, I think of something like uh, dogs. Dogs tend to be very stiff. And I'm only using dogs as a frame of reference because, you know, man's best friend. Generally, most people are familiar with dogs. Yeah. Um, whenever you your dog rolls over on its back and pets you pet its belly, it can't lay its arms flat to the side. The, like their shoulders are not structured to let them do that. Right. Um, Whereas in primates, we can we have all sorts of range of motion, and we have a very uh, a couple of big parts of that. Our our scapula, your shoulder blade, is very large and very flat, and we also have a very big clavicle, which is your collarbone. Uh, things like cats, cats barely have a clavicle. Depending on the species of cat you look at, they just kind of don't have one. And that just provides extra muscular support for, uh, for, for, for the arms. Also very famously in primates, we have opposable thumbs, uh, which just means that your thumb can close into the rest of your hand. Uh, but also with that, we have curvable fingers and toes, which again, thinking like a dog, they can't really curve their toes in toward their palm. Uh, they're, they're, fingers are just not structured in a way that does that hmm. i was actually thinking then, about this uh earlier this week like i was just trying to imagine what it would be like to live without thumbs and it would be really dang hard it'd be weird yeah yeah and it, that's something that humans i think take for granted a lot oh yeah um lastly moving toward the uh the ends of the, the limbs, humans have nails instead of claws. So as we've talked about before, I think we had a whole episode about claws. I don't remember what that episode was, but 
um, we have flat nails that just sit on the end of the uh, last phalange, the last phalanx, um, instead of fully encasing it like a claw does. This basically just gives you more grabbing surface and uh, more uh, feeling surface on, on your hands as well. And lastly, uh, we have plantigrade hands and feet, which means that when you walk, your entire foot or hand is on the ground compared to things like cats or dogs that run on their toes or things like horses that run on the very, very tip of their toes. But what about things like gorillas that use like their knuckles to walk on? Hmm. Is that not true? No, it is. It definitely is. And that's definitely something that I should have thought about. Um, <laughs> their, ba- their back feet still walk uh, fully l- like human feet. Right. Um, but I guess, yeah, I guess the, the apes that knuckle walk, because even most monkeys, like even the more terrestrial monkeys, mm-hmm. like uh, baboons and stuff, will walk fully palms down. Um, oh, really? But yeah, like, yeah. But like uh, gorillas and chimps and stuff. Yeah, I guess that technically would be digitigrade, which is what it's called right. when uh, you walk on your toes, like cats and dogs. Yeah. Um, interesting. Hmm. Because that, that's often just called knuckle walking, and I don't know if that's a specific kind of digitigrade. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I might have to look into that just because now I'm curious. <laughs> um, and then other than that, um, primates just tend to have relatively mobile bodies just to uh, allow ourselves to sort of scamper about in the trees, uh, you know, fairly well without, you know, slowing ourselves down. Um, but generally getting out of some non anatomical features that most primates share. If you look up pretty much anything about primates, everything will say how intelligent we are, which is we're, we're a little biased on that one. (laughs) Yeah. Toot our own horns. Right. Uh, but a big thing with primates is problem solving. Most primates are very good problem solvers. If you give them a new problem they've never seen before, very few animals will figure out a way to do it faster than primates. Uh, some of the only ones that I can think of that might be up there with it, with with us, are things like crows and their relatives and octopus. Yeah. Uh, the only downside that octopus have is that they don't work together because they eat each other. Uh, <laughs> uh, whereas primates generally and crows don't really have that problem. Uh, because also with primates, we are very social. There are very few completely solitary species of primate. Almost all of us are, live in some kind of group, you know, with the exception of sometimes groups will send off the males to live by themselves uh, and live in groups of primarily females. Uh, but there are, probably only a handful of primates where they live by themselves pretty much all the time. Yeah. Primates are also generally highly altricial, which means their babies are pretty much are kind of helpless. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas things like horses, uh, you know, a baby horse is up and, and running and keeping up with its uh, parents you know, within a couple of hours, yeah. whereas th- that is called precocial. Uh, primates are much more like baby birds in that we are kind of helpless, uh, potentially some of us for like 18 years. Uh, <laughs> still still <laughs> living with your parents. Yep. And then lastly, generally, as I sort of alluded to earlier, primates are pretty much only warm climate animals. There's a pretty obvious exception with humans. Humans live pretty much anywhere, but the only like cold climate primates, at least that are still alive today, uh, are the Japanese macaques that live kind of high up in the mountains in Japan. But that's pretty much the only species I could find that isn't at least, you know, maybe not tropical, but like subtropical or at least in warm, even if it's dry. It's these days pretty much just humans and Japanese macaques. Go Japanese macaques. Keep it yeah. up. So those are the general features, which I feel like most people generally would think are, are fairly obvious, which again, kind of because we are primates, 
you, you know a primate when you see one. Because you're like, that guy over there looks a little like me. So, now let's talk about some primate diversity. Since I mentioned, you know, how many of them, that there's quite a lot of them. And we'll go into this a bit more when we talk about their evolution in a little bit. But primates are primarily split into two groups. There are the strepsirini, or commonly called the wet-nosed primates. <laughs> and, you know, like, well, if you feel your own nose, typically it is not wet. <laughs> Let's, whereas something like a dog's nose is wet. Okay. So that's that's sort of what that means. But um, dogs are not primates. No, but the, I was just giving that sort of as an example. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so, so this group is the lemurs and the lorises and galagos. Lemurs, uh, very famously things like Zabumafu, if you are of roughly my age. Um, Uh, that's those days. Oh, I love Zabumafu. Um, so yeah, there is, uh, uh, several families of lemurs that are all, um, fairly closely related to one another. They range in size from you know, about 15, 20 pounds down to the smallest primate is a lemur, which weighs a couple of ounces. So they, they do all sorts of things. Uh, lemurs exclusively live on Madagascar. How unique. Yeah, they're, they're a strange group of little guys. Um, whereas the lorises... And Galagos live in various places around Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. They are small. These are the ones that are primarily solitary. Like I said, I think it's pretty much just these guys that tend to hang out by themselves. Uh, And also, for example, fun fact, there is one species, at at least one species, that is venomous. Whoa. How so? Yeah. The slow loris has toxic sacs in its armpits. <laughs> what an odd place to have toxic scent like stuff. Mm-hmm. And it will lick the the sacs to get the uh, uh, venom in its teeth. Or it will rub like or like lick its hands and then uh, rub its armpits to get the, the venom on its hands and then rub all of its fur in it to sort of coat itself in the poison. So it can be used uh, to catch prey if it sort of rubs it in its teeth, or if it rubs it on its body, it can be used defensively as well. So neat, weird little guys. So I just, sorry, I am confused how they can do that without killing themselves. I guess they must be have some immunity in them. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, most, um, I don't want to super make this generally generalization, right. but I feel like most things that are venomous can break down their own toxins. Yeah. If that makes but sense. I feel like that would be like a good evolutionary uh, feature to have. Well, actually, now that I think about it, so venom is really only useful if it, I guess it depends on the kind of venom little tangent here. Um, mm-hmm. You can drink snake venom and be perfectly fine. What? I'm, I'm, I mean, it's a bad way to find out if you have like an ulcer on your stomach or something, but right. um, yeah. So venom primarily is only, it depends on the kind of compound, obviously things like toads. If you bite or, or lick a toad, you're in for a bad time. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it depends on what kind of, toxin exactly it is yeah. um I, I didn't look too much more into it besides these weird little fuzzy guys licking their armpits and rubbing it all over themselves um, very cute they're they're so cute yeah um but yeah so the the, the wet nosed primates are just those groups the the lemurs and then the lorises and galagos there's there's not all that many of them. There's a handful of species. Spoilers, there used to be a lot more lemurs before humans got to Madagascar. Um, mm. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So that is sort of one side of the 
ma major split in primates. The other side is the haplorani, or the dry nosed primates, which is most primates that you're thinking of. I do have a dry nose. That's true. <laughs> uh, first, there are the tarsiers. Uh, they're just sort of, they, they look, if you know what an eye eye is. No. So an eye eye is, is a type of lemur, but they sort of look like that. They, they look kind of, I don't even know Maybe. super how to describe them. They, they look just sort of like a really scrawny monkey. They're giving creepy vibes for me. Yeah, eye eyes are, are real creepy. Um, so that was, that was, I guess, a bad example then, because, like I said, uh, eye eyes are lemurs. But uh, tarsiers are, are just outside true monkeys. Like I said, they look like just a, a monkey that needs to eat some more food. Um, <laughs> but So they are the most basal uh, haplorines, or the, the dry-nosed primates. After that, we get the simiaforms, or what most people would call simians. These are sort of your "quote unquote" higher primates. Again, this is this group is most of what you're thinking of as a primate. And these are sort of split into a couple of groups. First, we have your New World monkeys. There's five families here. This includes anything from South America or Central America. So we have your marmosets, your tamarins, your capuchin monkeys. Very famously in, in lots of movies, uh, the capuchin monkey was uh, the type of uh, monkey in Night at the Museum. Oh, nice. They're also very famous for um, being very cute. Uh, they are, I think a capuchin was also in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I'm pretty sure that was a capuchin too. Yeah. Very famous because they're small, cute, and fairly trainable. Um, However, squirrel monkeys, spider monkeys, howler monkeys are all in this group as well. You can tell this group because their nostrils kind of point sideways. Hmm. And also, if it has a prehensile tail, a tail that can wrap around stuff, uh, that is a New World monkey. Only New World monkeys have that. Now, other than that, we have the uh, Old World monkeys, which are the monkeys from Africa, uh Eurasia, because they used to be in Europe as well. Now I think there are technically some, because I think Gibraltar, a little island between Africa and Spain, is technically considered part of Europe. Mm. Um, so there is some monkeys in Europe natively, but very few. Uh, and all of these are in a single family. They're called the Kirkopithecidae. There are 23 genera. This is all of your macaques, baboons, mandrills. The proboscis monkey, any kind of monkey from Africa or Asia is in the single family. Cool. And then also within that, we have the hominoidea, which is your apes. Apes include your gibbons, which essentially just look like monkeys with really long arms and no tails. They still look very monkey-like. So they are hominoids, but not in the family hominidae, which is our family, the great ape family. Yay. And within the great apes, we have three species of orangutan, two species of gorilla. Uh, the chimpanzee is one species, and the bonobo is another species, both in the same genus, that are closely related to the single species of human that we have left. <laughs> one. A single species. And so that is sort of the different groups of primates. However, I'd like to point out here that taxonomy is really hard. Taxonomy being how different animals are related to one another and the names that we give yeah. those groups. We have an entire episode about it, episode 58. And depending on what you count as monkeys, apes are monkeys. Because there's always that person who's like, who somebody calls a chimp a monkey and someone's like, well, actually they're apes, <laughs> not monkeys. Um, that's, it's sort of like what you're both right. Right. For the same reason that birds are dinosaurs. You don't stop being a member of a group 
just because you lose some of the features of that group. Yeah. And so if you count new world monkeys as monkeys and also count old world monkeys as monkeys, apes must also be monkeys because apes evolved from the old world monkeys, if that makes sense. And therefore, we are monkeys. Therefore, humans are monkeys. Although I will add a very stern caveat in that that has been used for racism purposes for a very long time. Oh. So it's not typically useful to call humans monkeys uh, because it can be racist. Um, yeah, I don't support that. Right. Racism bad. Um, bad. So while, yes, hu humans are monkeys. So with that caveat out of the way, we're moving on. Nice. And uh, I really want to mention here a little bit about conservation. Because overall, primates are not doing great. Oh, no. So I mentioned I... a couple of times, primates primarily live in tropical areas. And humans are having a really good time chopping those down right now. Yeah. So around 60% of all primate species are considered threatened by the ICUN, which is the international body that sort of keeps track of what species are listed as endangered, what species are listed as uh, threatened, vulnerable, etc. And so, like I said, 60% are threatened and threatened is the term that it's very broad threatened includes vulnerable endangered and critically endangered wow yeah so 60 percent and on top of that 75 percent of primates have decreasing populations so there's the 60 percent that are threatened and then another 15 percent that are on the way there Jeez. And specifically, w one of the groups that is the hardest hit are the apes. There are 28 species of ape. And 26 of the 28 are endangered or critically endangered. One of them is listed as vulnerable, so not quite endangered, but close. And then the other species is us. What is the vulnerable species? Do you remember? Uh, I want to say it was the uh, the white gibbon, or or because I'm remembering its species name having something with like Lucas or something. It's, it's a species of gibbon. All of okay. the great apes besides us are endangered or critically endangered. <sighs> Sad moments. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I mentioned earlier. I don't have specific numbers for this, but lemurs also are doing really bad. Um. Like I said, they are endemic to Madagascar. That's the only place they live naturally. And while Madagascar is a big island, it is still an island. And so that just inherently means that the animals that live there have smaller population numbers. And it is harder for them to survive when new things get introduced to their environment. Yeah. Humans have been there for about a little over 2,000 years something around that ballpark. And uh, basically since humans got there, lemurs have just plummeted. Yeah. Including some recent extinctions that I'll talk about in, uh, in a little bit. So yeah, humans are just doing real bad things for all of our cousins. In some cases though, there was actually was a very remarkable case of, um, I want to say it was rhesus macaques where they were also very, very close to extinction, but then laws were placed in places like, I think like specifically India. And since then, th these are the macaques that you see stealing people's stuff at all oh. the temples and stuff in Asia. Nowadays, the, those, you know, efforts to protect them have worked. Some would say too much and are a yeah. bit of a nuisance now. Um, yeah, there are so many of them that uh, they're causing problems for people. So, which is a good thing, you know, compared to the yeah. alternative. Right. Um, so, we definitely have examples of how conserving primates can work and work well. 
but we have to care. <laughs> Long story yes. short. Um, and that's why conservation is so important. Yes, exactly. So with that, let's let's talk about their evolution because it's it's a really interesting sort of story because primates are very strange mammals. Like I said, everything that makes a mammal a mammal, primates just kind of don't do correctly. The original mammals, uh, which we talk, we talk about the entire series of mammal evolution up to when we got mammals in episodes 35 and 53. And broadly, we'll, we'll start sort of how, how we classify mammals in general before we talk about primates. So mammals are split into three groups. There's the monotremes, which are the ones that lay eggs, the platypus and the echidna. Marsupials, the ones that have pouches, your kangaroos, koalas, wombats, etc., possums. And then there are the placentals, which is everything else, including primates. But within placentals, we also have some larger scale groups. And I'm just doing this to sort of establish what primates are closely related to. Because for a while, we weren't quite sure because primates are so strange. So the placentals are split up into four larger groups. There are the xenarthrins, which are the weird guys from down in South America. Things like your armadillos, anteaters, uh, sloths. Then there are your afrotherians, which primarily come from Africa, but also include, um, you know, groups that have branched out elsewhere. These are two of the big groups in this, uh, in the afrotherians are the elephants, which we talked about in episode 26, and manatees, which we talked about in episode 56. But also includes things like hyraxes, uh, golden moles, aardvarks, etc. Cool. Uh, the the larger group, in terms of, you know, the the I guess the more disparate group. There's a, there's a lot of diversity of shapes. In this next group. This is the Laurasia therians. This is everything from um, your shrews, moles, all the way up to carnivorans. So things like your cats and dogs. Uh, all the way also including things like your horses, your deer, your whales, all in this group. Really diverse group. And lastly, we have the group that we, that we are in called the U Archontagliris. A bit <laughs> of a mouthful. Yeah, it is. So, this is split into this is further split into two groups called the Gliris, which are your rodents and lagomorphs, uh, lagomorphs being your rabbits and hares. And then the Uarkanta, which are the tree shrews, which don't always live in trees and are definitely not shrews. Sure. And then the <laughs> primatomorphs. Primates and our closest cousins, the uh, Dermopterans, which mm. are sometimes called flying lemurs, but they glide and are not lemurs. I, I don't like when people give names to things that are not accurate, but that happens a lot in biology. <laughs> Um, yeah. But if you want to look up something that is very cute, look up flying right. lemurs. They're super cute. So these are uh, a, a group that is the closest to primates without being a primate that are still alive. Uh, and the reason that I go through all of this is to say primates, for as diverse as they are, actually occupy a very small corner. Of, yes. of the mammal tree. And also to say, partially because we are such a small corner, but also for a lot of other reasons, the primate fossil record's generally not good. Oh, why is that? So, for a couple of reasons that I've sort of alluded to, but primates are generally small. Humans are up there with the biggest primates around today. Um, there's really only one species that is bigger and that's, well, I guess two, cause that's the, the two species of gorilla. Um, on average, humans are considerably bigger than th things like the chimps and bonobos and the orangutans. So, and those are the only ones that really give us a run for our money. So, uh, yeah. most primates are really small. And because of that, you know, smaller things just have more fragile bones. They don't tend to preserve and become fossils as well. Primates are also primarily arboreal, 
And so if you spend most of your time in the trees, when you die, you're not in a place where you can easily be buried, which is what you need to become a fossil. Mm -hmm. And lastly, like I said, uh, primates really like living in tropical rainforests, which is an environment that is really bad at preserving fossils. Uh, their soils tend to be really acidic, and bones being made out of primarily calcium phosphate uh, dissolve in acid. Uh, and also, for the most part, there's just so much organic reworking and so much just life going on in uh, in rainforest that all of those materials used to make a primate just get sort of recycled into their environment too quickly before things can get buried. Makes sense. So generally a pretty bad fossil record, but that doesn't mean we have nothing. You know, primates are not bats. For bats, we actually have nothing. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say nothing, but for bats, we basically have nothing. For primates, we do have some things. If you look up or Google, what is the first primate? you will usually see something that mentions the genus Purgatorius, which is a very fun name. Yeah, Purgatory. Uh, and I think it's a very fitting name because we don't actually know where this thing goes. So it's just kind yeah, of sitting in fitting. evolutionary purgatory. <laughs> um, depending on what source you read, it could be an early primate. It could be not closely related to primates at all. Or... It could be sort of a middle ground uh, and be a member of a group called the Plesiodapiforms. And Plesiodapiforms are a very strange group of mammals, which is why they are likely to be related to primates. They sort of look like a, a very slender squirrel, but with a, yeah, a kind of longer head and longer arms. That's what I was thinking when I looked it up. Uh, mm -hmm. before you did mention that yeah so if, if it's a squirrel that walks on its hands kind of like a monkey does more or less um, and this group the plesiodapiforms could be found pretty much all over the world we have fossils of them in, in North America uh, in a couple places in Eurasia I think some in Africa but don't quote me on that um, and they they were very widespread in the sort of immediate aftermath of the end Cretaceous mass extinction 66 million years ago that wiped out all of the non-bird dinosaurs. And going forward, I'm going to mention some dates in terms of, you know, X millions of years for when different groups did whatever. Uh, take all of those with a grain of salt, especially for this episode, always take, you know, any date that I give you with a grain of salt just because we can never be completely exact. But um, yeah. because we don't have great fossils, a lot of this is based off of genetic stuff, which can vary wildly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, for example, several sources said that primates might have sort of evolved from the, that group, the Plesiodapiforms, somewhere right around 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous. But I also saw somewhere that genetics suggests that lemurs split from lorises before that, hmm. before primates had even evolved yet. So that's weird. It is weird. Uh, so obviously one of those is not correct. Um, <laughs> However, so, like I said, take all these with a grain of salt. There might be some contradictions. So, I, I saw most consistently that Plesiodapiforms and their relatives sort of split off from the flying lemur group. Uh, sometime in the late Cretaceous, give or take 70 to 75 million years ago. This is, dinosaurs were still running around. Um, completely different world than we have today. Uh, primates are a very, one of the earliest groups of modern mammals that we still have today to sort of show up and do their thing. The, you know, after those primates show up, 
lemurs and lorises take their split. The, the wet-nosed primates take their split uh, around 63 million years ago. So sort of right after all the dinosaurs went extinct. And here I want to point out a, a weird trend in primate evolution and that primates really love surfing. What? Yeah. Primates make a habit of, uh, it's called rafting where they will get out to an Island or to some other distant landmass, likely on a piece of like floating vegetation after a big storm or something Mm -hmm. and colonize new places that way. Wow. That, that is a very running theme for primates. Yeah. So to my knowledge, we don't have any lemur fossils because like I said, lemurs today are exclusive to Madagascar. I don't even think we have any lemur fossils from mainland Africa. So Hmm. at some point, a lemur ancestor was washed out to Madagascar, um, which like I said, is a very big island. And so that gave them lots of room to diversify. Uh, However, Madagascar, because it is very tropical, and for those reasons I mentioned earlier, doesn't really have much of a fossil record. So all of the evolutionary history of lemurs primarily comes from genetic stuff. So I'm not going to super go into anything within lemurs. However, we do know some very recently extinct lemurs are recent enough that they potentially, they're probably already on their way out when humans got there, but um, might have still been there when humans got to Madagascar including one that was about the size of a gorilla. What? Yeah. Um, So it's a part of a group called the sloth lemurs, which again is not a good name because they're not really primates are not related to sloths at all. Um, But some of them are thought to have lived kind of like uh, sloths where they potentially might've even been like hanging upside down from trees and things like that. Um, Wow. Yeah. So one of them, like I said, was about the size of a gorilla or, or a bear or something to, to that sort of size range. Um, but either it went extinct right before humans got to Mad- Madagascar or only, you know, 2000 years ago or so or right after. Hmm. So that's that's that on lemurs. The, the, that was the first group to really sort of sail uh, across. Uh, the first haplorine fossils, which is the dry-nosed primates, most monkeys and things that you're thinking of, uh, are found in China sometime back in the Paleocene, around 58 million years ago. And the first simians, which are sort of the, like I said, the higher primates, um, also found in Asia sometime around 40 million years ago. And pretty much right around that time, uh, that group surfed from Asia over to Africa, because at the time they were uh, a lot more separate than they are today. So they had to actually ride some currents or or, uh, something to get them from Asia to Africa. Because why? So uh, because of plate tectonics, Africa was much farther away. Yeah. Uh, Because right now to get from Asia to Africa, you pretty much just have to, um, granted, you know, the, the Arabian Peninsula is not a particularly hospitable place. But at the mm-hmm. time, it was still fairly tropical. Um, okay. Global conditions at, in the world at this point were very, um, you know, much warmer and much wetter climate than, than it is today. Even mm-hmm. in places that are mainly desert, like the Arabian Peninsula. So um, to get from like the, the tip of the Arabian Peninsula to Africa is probably only a couple of miles worth yeah. of ocean which is too long to swim but if you're on a little boat that would sail there for you not too bad um but at the time this was considerably farther um probably in, in the order of hundreds to maybe thousands of, of miles wow. uh, but we know that it must have happened because we have fossils from that time showing that these new simian primates making their way from asia to africa And then pretty shortly after that is another much, the the farthest aims of the primates getting from Africa to South America. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, because at this time, South America was on its own. It might have barely still been connected to Antarctica, but by 40 million years ago or so, probably not. Um, actually, definitely not, I think. Um, and so, granted, again, due to plate tectonics, in this case, uh, Africa and South America were closer together than they are. It was probably only about two thirds of the distance that it is today, but that's still a couple thousand miles. <laughs> yeah. How do they survive? So, depending on the ocean currents, um, it's it sort of been proposed that they could have made that journey in as little as uh, a couple of weeks, which <laughs> if you're just a small little primate dude hanging out on uh, you know, a big log or a big mat of vegetation, that's hypothetically not, that's hypothetically possible. And in fact, we, we know that it must have happened because we have monkeys there. Yeah. And they and couldn't so, have like, evolved from something else that was already there no okay um so south america was really weird because it was isolated for so long so um it had a lot of very strange groups that were very different from everything else Hmm. so they would not look as primate-y as they do they are very clearly primates if you look at all of their anatomy um so to have something that convergent would be more unlikely than monkeys rafting across the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. And we also have other groups that did this too. Uh, There's a group of rodents called the caviomorph rodents uh, that include things like capybaras and chinchillas that also made the same journey. So because we have it from multiple groups, we know that it's at least possible. Right. So that happened. Somewhere, again, the genetics gives a range of 33 million years ago to 70 million years ago. Not particularly helpful. Um, But based on fossils, the good evidence, uh, ballpark range of 40 million years ago or so. And then from there, for a couple million years, things just sort of continue to, to stay the course. All these groups now in South America, Africa, Eurasia continue to sort of diversify. But in the early Miocene period or uh, epic, around 27 million years ago, primates um, by this point had also just gone extinct in North America. North America did have primates at one time. Whereas today there are none that are native here besides very recently humans. Yep. So they had their own primates, but sometime by the early Miocene, they had gone extinct, likely due to drying global conditions, getting rid of those nice forests that they like. A little bit later, around 13 million years ago, the first apes evolved from the old world monkeys in Eastern Africa. We have lots and lots of different fossils showing that this is where apes showed up in the sort of uh, the rift valley around like a sort of ethiopia kenya sort of area uh, of africa and then after that apes very quickly spread all across eurasia uh, mostly staying in warm regions uh like uh, around the mediterranean but we have ape fossils from italy israel i think some from greece uh as well so they they really yeah as as soon as apes evolved they immediately just started spreading all around uh, including the the group that would lead to orangutans. They shot over toward uh, East Asia, uh, also included uh, on the sort of orangutan branch, the largest primate ever uh, called Gigantopithecus. Really cool. If you've ever seen the uh, live action Jungle Book, that's what they changed King Louis to be. Yeah. Very fun. It even, he even mentions it in his song. Very fun. Yeah. Yeah. Very fun. And then lastly, Somewhere between 8 million years and 4 million years ago, gorillas split off, and then the chimps and bonobos branch split off from the human lineage. And that's all I'm going to say about humans. (laughs) Oh boy. Uh, You know, I mentioned primate fossils aren't great. Oh, we have so many human fossils. Um, So that will definitely be its own episode at some point. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. 
So that is all we have for primates today. Sophia, yeah. what have you brought us today for Swamp Corner? Swamp Corner, I have no primates. Uh, oh, we're bummer. going... <laughs> I think we could use a break after yeah. learning all of that knowledge. But for you, I have today the Southern Flounder, Paralichthyus lithostigma, um, also known as the left-eyed flounder. Um, they're found throughout the Gulf and uh, along the coast. Okay. They uh, spawn between October and November uh, when the temperatures are cool and they migrate offshore to spawn. Um, females can spawn every three to seven days. Oh, which, wow. Yeah. Um, good for them. They're doing like 14,000 to 68,000 eggs per spawn. Wow. That's, yeah. That is so many eggs. Yeah. And uh, the, the young fish of um, are born with um, an eye on each side of their body uh, before they grow to an inch long. Then they switch to um, both of their eyes being on the left side, which is why this specific species is called the left-eyed flounder. I've, I've always found that so strange. Yeah. Because, like, flounders are, you know, like, their thing is that they are sideways. Yep. yep. But, like, if you look at, like, a fresh-hatched flounder, it just looks like a normal fish. Yep. It's pretty Weirdos. cool. And, and they transition, like, at a very small size. Like, I've seen mm-hmm. some in my samples that are, like, uh, a centimeter, maybe. And they already oh, wow. have, like, transitioned over Wow. Um, but it makes them able to do what they're good at, and that's being ambush predators. They'll lie on the bottom and wait for a prey to swim overhead, and they'll feed on things like shrimp, mullet, anchovies, uh, small fish like that. Um, and so they're also kind of will feed on whatever is available when mm-hmm. it's most opportunistic, I guess. Um And yes, they live in mud bottom estuaries and coastal waters, but they can also be found by bridges, jetties, and small boats. Um, Yeah, they're a a fish that is fished, I guess, by anglers. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Louisiana, there's no size limit to which you can take a flounder. Uh But you're only allowed to take 10 per day per person. Interesting. Yeah. I would have liked to seen, I looked on the LDWF, uh, which is like Mm -hmm. the Louisiana Department of Wildlife Fisheries regulations. And I would have liked to seen a size limit on them just as standard practice with every other thing. But I did like to see that like um, their uh, season is closed during the time that they're um, spawning. Okay. Yeah. So that is all I have for you for Swamp Corner. Man, I I will never not be amazed by fish. Yeah, they're cool. Because, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, this episode we talked all about, you know, everything from that those weirdo lorises that lick their armpits to everything the size of a gorilla or, like I said, gig- Gigantopithecus. Obviously, in the movie, it was a bit bigger than uh, <laughs> than what it actually was. But it was, it was yeah. you know, roughly Bigfoot size, like 10 feet tall. Yeah. Um, and then there's fish who are like, mm, I'm just going to rotate my entire face <laughs> so that I can look at you while laying on my side with both eyes. <laughs> They went the lazy route. They sure did. <laughs> but, you know, good for them, I exactly. guess. <laughs> Weirdos. Anyway, thank you for that Swamp Corner, Fia. And thank you all for listening. This has been episode 86 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Gavin. That has been Fia, and we will see you all next week. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.